in the presentation will play over your computer speakers, even if you're connected on the phone, so please make sure those are turned on. We have a terrific panel for you today. I'm going to start things off by introducing Bill Bradley, Senior Associate at Stantec, and Chair-Elect of A4RLE to get us started. Aubrey, thank you, and thank you to you too, Janelle. Um, before we dive in, I want to put on my A4LE cap and welcome those tuning in across the country. Looks like we've got a great turnout. Shout out to, to John Hill, former president of the Virginia chapter, who's tuning in from Great Falls, Virginia. Uh, Shannon Needham, upper school learning specialist at Sandy Springs Friends School in Maryland. Um, also Nicole Ward, design manager in the Office of Capital Programs for the School District of Philadelphia. And it looks like I see Wayne Lee, Director of Planning of Frederick County, Virginia, um, and many others. Very glad that you're all here, along with your April LA colleagues in uh, California, Washington State, Kansas, Missouri, Texas, Louisiana, Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C., and New Jersey. And I hope I didn't leave anybody out, but it looks like we've got a lot of designers on board, but also a lot of planners, educators, and facility directors. That's great. Um, as Aubrey said, my name is Bill Bradley. I'm chair-elect of the Association for Learning Environments. And on behalf of my colleagues on the board and the A4LE staff at headquarters, I want to welcome you to the next in a series of professional development events that A4LE is organizing in keeping with the association's vision of connecting professionals seeking opportunities at the intersection of learning and design. I don't know about you, um, but I think it's great that A4LE is offering these and that you're here. Uh, it's increasingly important that we stay connected and that we don't stop talking and raising the bar and seeking to make learning environments better and better, even as outside forces weigh heavy and attempt to deter us. So thank you for attending and lending your voice. Before we get rolling, um, I do want to note that this is, presentation has been approved for AIA credits, and for members of that organization in attendance, the A4LE staff will automatically submit your attendance for credit. And if you wish to self-report, you can. You can obtain a copy of that certificate uh, of completion and do so. So with that, I would like to introduce my colleague, Camilo Behrman, Senior Associate and Senior Project Designer for Stantec. Camilo, say hello. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, our agenda today is straightforward. We're going to introduce the concept of co-creation, discuss the research, share a case study, and then go a little more into the theory before wrapping up with recommendations. Um, as Aubrey said, if at any point you have questions, please type them into the presentation chat box, and we'll do our best to get to them. All right. So, Milo. Yes. Yeah, so, hello again. Uh, so co-creation, uh, we've been drawing very heavily from a book called uh, Seven Principles of Complete Co-Creation by uh, Jansen and Peters, which makes an unflinching argument that co-creation uh, is not complete co-creation or collaboration, um, unless the end users, in this instance the students, uh, and you'll see in the case study we, did, we were discussing, uh, are involved in a deep and meaningful way throughout the entire process. Um, indeed, the end user is playing a central role uh, note that sometimes we'll be using the term end users and students interchangeably, um, but we recognize that there are other end users, of course, to a school building. There's administrators and teachers and other support staff. However, this presentation will focus on the central role students can play in the engagement process. Um, so by way of definition, co-creation, is it a fancy way of saying collaboration? Well, perhaps, but it means more. Um, and Jansen and Peters de, uh, define it by saying it's a transparent process of value creation, ongoing, productive collaboration, and supported by all re relevant parties. The book outlines seven principles. Uh, we will be looking at one, one of those principles, but there's a lot of overlap. And I think you'll see that when we discuss the process of co-creating with end users, it's really about co-creating and collaborating together ongoing. It's not checking off the box at one point in time. Um, it's productive, meaning that it's meant to be constructive. It is uh, transparent in that the co-creators know what they're doing and people outside of the co-creation process 
also understand what's going on and why, um, and it's around certain values. And very important to uh, sort of deep collaboration um, is this idea that it's supported, uh, that there's the resources, the time, the funds available uh, to do a really, uh, uh, to honor the process uh, properly. So what is the value of co-creation for a school design pro pro project? Um, the book I mentioned really uh, speaks a lot about co-creation in the business context where the process of co-creation uh, really benefits the end product. The users are involved, for instance, but the main benefit is of the end product. But you'll see that in our discussion, we're talking about the process of co-creation or deep collaboration, not what makes a school building better, we want to call that the end product, but also has a very powerful uh, effect on the users, in, in this instance, the students. Um, so it's, it's mutually beneficial, the, the process um, for both the users and the school design course. And that's our fundamental premise. And when, when working on facility projects, extensive student involvement ongoing makes the design solution better and the engagement has a positive long-lasting effect on the student's experience. Thank you, Camila. So uh, if you think about co-creation within the context of education, it's part and parcel of next generation learning in which we're encouraging students to create, collaborate, and communicate. Uh, what's more is we transition from a teacher-centric bias to one that's equally student-centric, and we encourage students more and more to be responsible for their own learning as they chart their course. Co-creation reinforces that idea. In other words, it's not simply when you think about planning a school, adults making decisions about students in a vacuum. Rather, students are invited into the conversation in a very meaningful way. And there's a good bit of research pointing to the value of co-creation, including research about the value of involving students in shaping their environment. And you, and you see that here, and you see some of these references. Um, involving learners in the design of learning environments is expected to improve design quality, to foster a participatory culture, and contribute to both student learning processes and their well-being. Other research goes on to say that having an opportunity to influence one's learning environment has been seen to increase students' overall well-being, a sense of community, and engagement, motivation, and positive attitudes towards school, all things that we'd like to encourage, of course. All of this research is summarized in Tina McCullough's research, her dissertation entitled Design Framework and Principles for Co-Designing Learning Environments, Fostering Learning and Well-Being, in which she responds to the need for the development of a theoretical, empirically, and practically sound design framework and principles for involving students in a participatory design process. So all by way of saying, if you intuit that engaging students is a good idea, then you're right. Uh, there's actually the research to support your, your intuition. So with that as a basis, let's take a look at, the, at a case study, the co-location of two schools with disparate populations. Um, the two schools are Ben Franklin High School and the Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia. If you know Philadelphia and you recognize uh, parts of the city here on the map, you know that the two schools are not physically very far apart, just north and west of downtown, respectively, yet the two populations couldn't be more disparate. Um, the students at Ben Franklin High School are 100% economically disadvantaged, have a relatively low graduation rate at 46% and are not expressly proficient on whole on standardized testing. In contrast, uh, the students at the Science Leadership Academy are more socioeconomically diverse, have a very high graduation rate at 99%, and perform much higher on literacy, math, and science. Ben Franklin is a comprehensive high school, whereas the Science Leadership Academy, which has been visited by Barack Obama, among others, is a magnet school with very high aspirations. So the idea was to co-locate these two schools, each with roughly 500 students, into a building currently housed by the students at Ben Franklin High School. 
So in other words, take the kids from the Science Leadership Academy and put them in Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin has the capacity. So moving the students at the Science Leadership Academy, which are these students pictured below, whose uh, lease was expiring uh, with the students at Ben Franklin, pictured above, uh, who had room to spare. Our, our challenge as a design team, as planners, is really twofold. Um, determining how to renovate the building to accommodate the two schools, which, by the way, was a fairly straightforward matter. And second, figuring out how to meld these populations culturally and operationally, which was less so. Uh, you can imagine some of the, the conflict that might have arisen. And you can also imagine that um, the anxiety that, that might have been expressed came more from, from, the, from the parents than the students. Um, and also some of the teachers and administrators. So in the end, this process of co-creation that we're talking about lent itself to, to melding these populations uh, as the engagement process became a crucible for, for co-location. Some of the facts and figures. Um, blank slide. I'm sorry, I'm seeing a blank slide on my screen. Oh, there we go. Just maybe a lag. So let's let's talk about the building um, for the for the architects who are curious about what uh, the building itself looked like. Um, ben Franklin is a six-story modernist institutional facility erected in 1960 with a 1970 gym addition. It's located in the urban context, about eight blocks north of downtown proper. You can see it pictured here with the students looking at it from the window of our conference room in our Philadelphia office, which is literally across the street. And you can imagine these students were excited to see the building from this perspective from the first time. The inside is as you might expect for a building, uh, school built at this time. The industrial era collection of classrooms lining either side of double loaded corridors stacked one atop the other for very efficient, uh, 270,000 square foot, six foot facility. The hallways were lined with lockers, the demising walls were opaque, and the classrooms had a single orientation reinforced by rows of desks facing a teaching wall. And as you can see here, also in the upper left, the students who entered the building uh, came into a, a very small lobby through which they had to first pass, um, first had to pass through um, metal detectors. And with all due respect uh, to my colleagues at SDP, Ben Franklin was not what you would call a very happy or hopeful or inspiring environment, hence the opportunity for a renovation. So with that as a context, let's overlay co-creation. And the first thing that we had to do was determine um, with whom to engage and at what level. And, and you see here on the right some of the prospective members that we consider any time we do co-location. Is it board members? Uh, is it building level or central office administrators? Um, folks from facilities? The teachers and staff? Um, the neighbors? Community groups? Um, of course, the students. And then you have to consider after you figure out who you're going to engage, at what level you will engage them. Is it all about being informed, just telling them what's happening so that they know? Um, are you asking? Are you looking for input? Are you looking for input at the level of having them help develop the solution? Or, or maybe you can execute part of the project, like um, murals and things of that sort. So thinking about co-creation, you have to identify the stakeholders and, and at what level you'll engage the various ones of them. Camila? Bill, the, yeah, the, um, the book that I had mentioned, uh, The Seven Principles of Complete Co-Creation, does a very good job of, of sort of fleshing out the different kinds of engagement, the, the idea of at what level. And on the left, you see these diagrams, um, which really represent that people, the end users, at different points in time along the co-creation trajectory will play different roles. So um, you'll see, for instance, that at times we tap into the students' uh, expertise to, as informants, so they, they can inform us and give us information about the day in the life, um, about how their school works, but other times we're asking to understand 
what inspires them about school, or, or could they be evaluators and evaluate some design solutions that we might be proposing. Um, we also transpose, transposed a couple of the roles uh, in the book, uh, co-producer uh, and co-developer. We, we've changed them to co-designer and co-planner, respectively. Um, and throughout this presentation, we'll, we'll try to uh, re remind folks that the different roles that, that the same group of students played throughout the co-creation process. Thanks, Camila. Um, the engagement with the students wasn't um, a single point in time. Well, let me go back to the slide and say that in, in Philadelphia, we did we um, convened a, a campus planning team, which is this group that's um, surrounded by the orange box. And you can see they're represented by the, the two different schools. And so we had folks from Central Office School District of Philadelphia. And then we also had leadership, building level leadership from Brim Franklin and from the Science Leadership Academy, and included students, teachers, and parents. So that was the campus planning team with whom we met regularly. And then there was a steering committee. And the steering committee um, was also part of the campus planning team, so they were part of all of those conversations. But as part of those conversations, we would then retreat with the, the steering committee, sometimes called the executive committee. And they are the decision makers. And we typically um, limit this group to a fairly small group of, of people who are empowered to actually make decisions so that when ideas are, are put forward in the planning teams, um, and sometimes they're conflicting or sometimes they're not in scope or in budget, we have to come back to the steering committee and they say, you know, that's not in scope right now. Well, that's a great idea. We're going to figure out how to get it in scope and we want you to pursue that. So. It's a way of helping us sort through the information is to have these two levels of, of input. And um, and then as far as the engagement with the students, I think it's important to understand that it wasn't a point in time check-in. And we've, we've done this before where you, you get together some of the student leadership and you have a, a, a pizza party, you bring food, and they come in, they provide their input, but then they're gone. In the co-creation process, it's really um, an iterative process, continual engagement with multiple touches and a variety of activities intended to, to first inform them, because the students don't know anything necessarily about school design or planning. So to first inform them, and then to solicit input. And so one of the first things we did in Philadelphia is work with the students to develop success factors. And you can see these here. Um, both schools wanted to maintain their unique identities. At the same time, they want they recognize the potential, and they wanted to capitalize on the on the opportunity to create and foster a new sense of pride of this this co-location of these two schools. And it was very interesting um, that while they wanted to be separate, they also wanted to find opportunities to come together and ease into a relationship, so that over time, whereas the two populations would be separate within the building, which is what the the mandate was, was to be physically separate within the building. Students over time wanted to ease that and to break down those barriers. And so in designing, they directed us to, to make the demising walls temporary so that at some point, if they wanted to, um, if the experiment proved out that those demising walls could be removed easily. Obviously, a success factor upgrading existing conditions and, and uh, being completed on time and within budget. They also told us what they didn't want. They didn't want to create inequity. Uh, they didn't want to miss the opportunity to affect positive change, and they did not want their input to be excluded. And in the end of the day, they did not want us to get it wrong, fair enough. And so one of the first things we did was with student shadowing. And I would, I would encourage you, if you haven't done this before, to do this at the beginning of the project. And when we did it, it involved our entire team, which included folks from the School District of Philadelphia. And, and as much as I think we all think we remember what school was like, it's, it's frankly been a long time since we sat in those chairs. And, and as much as the chairs and the desks resemble when I was in high school many, many years ago, the issues that the students are dealing with are, are very much very different. And the way they handle them are very different. So it's very helpful um, to, to walk them a mile, not in their shoes, but, but with them. Very eye-opening. Another thing we did was we invited them into our office. And we um, shared with them information about school design. We shared precedents. You know, this is the kind of thing that it could be. And we shared with them 
what we call educational space types. Um, these kinds of things that you see here, a different language around um, planning and design. So it's not about classrooms or gyms or cafeterias. It's really the language of spaces that's consistent with the kinds of differentiated instruction that was expected. So we shared these ideas with them and gave them the tools, equipped them with the knowledge to be able to speak intelligently when they were talking about the ideas that, and when they were framing their own ideas. Thank you, Bill. Um, yes. I'm, there you go. Okay. So with that, uh, with that common ground where we learned a lot uh, from the students, certainly by shadowing and just meeting with them and understanding what would make a great project, what wouldn't make a great project, and also sharing with the students from our perspective what we know, what we've learned about learning environments through through the space types and having a dialogue around that. Um, then we jumped into uh, co-creation, co-designing at multiple levels. <clears throat> One thing we looked at was how can we how can we understand how the attitude towards sharing a building, and then we dove down deeper into sort of a planning exercise that within that building, what are the academic areas like, and then lastly we went into more of a design exercise, uh, which is the look and feel, if you will, of, of parts of the building. So, this idea of sharing a building together, this co-creation and co-location. Um, is really an idea about cooperation. Of course, there's double entendre here uh, that there's a cooperative aspect of collaborating together, but more to the point, how would they cooperate the school? How would students, uh, how would they think it works? Uh, so we'll get into the, into the details in this presentation of how the students inform the selection or how to divvy up the school, if you will, uh, what would be shared. Uh, not shared, but we won't go too deep into the administrative operation side of, uh, of cooperating schools. The existing building, you saw a photograph of it from a conference room. Um, this is an exploded view of the school with uh, on, on the lowest level, uh, shared things like auditorium, gymnasium, certainly uh, administrative areas. But on top of the lowest floor are five floors, a total of six floors, of predominantly academic area. And you can see the building is sort of naturally split into a left and right uh, because of a, a core that's in the middle. Um, What we did is we came to the students and, and, and the, uh, the campus planning committee with uh, various options, so three options, for how they might start to think about uh, co-location in the building. One option was to say that uh, both programs, one, one school, SLA, shown in orange on the slide, and the other school, Ben Franklin High School, shown in yellow, uh, that they could simply take the school and, and, and choose a side, right, the left or the right. Um, and perhaps one way to come together is to create a commons um, centrally located. In this instance, we're, we're, I'm showing two dashed commons of double high space. And those commons belong to both schools. They are not one assigned to one and the other assigned to the other. Uh, and the point would be that in the middle, is where both schools could intermingle throughout the day. And that might look something like uh, these precedent image, images on the screen, where um, there's a centrally located uh, collaborative lobby area, but also there's an opening from floor to floor. Uh, that was one of the options we proposed to them. But another one, something completely different, was to take this idea of a shared collaborative uh, social space put it down on the first floor, and we call this one the common foundation. Uh, pretty straightforward that the, the building would have a main concourse on the first floor that would be the place for the schools, although they're separate. Let me go back one slide. And they could be separated along the left-right divide, or as you can see here, there's two floors of yellow, one school, and two floors of orange and other schools. Um, really irrelevant. The point would be that 
they could share a main concourse and the students would intermingle and get to know each other uh, in one main socialization space that would be uh, lively at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day as students come and go. And lastly, we offered uh, an idea about uh, a living room for each of the schools, not unlike perhaps an urban apartment building where you might come in off of the sidewalk. There's a, a ground floor with shared amenities, lobbies, mail rooms, fitness, et cetera. But then you would take the stairs or the elevator up to your, uh, to your apartment. And in that apartment, you would walk into a living room. Um, and in this instance, each school would get its own living room and uh, once you enter that living room you enter essentially the front door of the school and those living rooms could be uh, what you might imagine them to be something that is highly uh, flexible um, not always programmed space but for collaboration socialization and a wonderful front door image for the school so there was great discussion um, and in the end the students vote uh, and opinions counted just as much as other members of the campus planning team. And they, they had a great time considering uh, the different possibilities. If I can animate this. The final result was that there was an overwhelming preference to create a real sense of identity for each of the programs uh, through this living room option. And we modified it, of course, as we went through. Um, but uh, the students had a major role to play to defining what the, the fundamental solution was and how the two schools will, uh, will co-locate in the building. Um, Bill mentioned this idea of uh, easing into a relationship. Uh, and so these, the, the option three that the students selected really starts with an idea that the schools are separate, but over time, for instance, this core between the two living rooms could be eroded and perhaps there could be one shared living room as they uh, start to develop a comfort level with each other and foster an ongoing dialogue. So um, with that, we started to, to drill down into more of design uh, activities, if you will. And one activity was- Hey, Camilo, can I, yes. can I interrupt? Um, Please. There's a good question that I think is worth answering at this point. If you go back to, um, Go back a slide. I guess I can go back a slide. Yeah, there. Um, the question that was asked is, what was the thinking in dividing the schools with classes on each level as opposed to each school on a floor of its own? Um, and might the latter mean less travel and congestion and stairs? And I started the response by saying that, that this was something that we talked a lot about during the, the planning process, um, how to divide the school. And I think it's worth reiterating that that there was, by the way, a lot of discussion, in case you're wondering, about more of a commingled approach. Um, but the direction was very clearly that it needed to be two separate schools. So do you do them left and right? Do you do them one, two, three, four, five, six? Do you alternate? You know, how do you do them? And so, Camila, can you share a little bit about how that ended up? I mean, we know how it ended up, but how we got there. I'd be happy to. Pam, I'm sorry, I, I didn't see your question. Bill, thank you for noticing that. Um, in the discussion about how to divide the school and whether the school should be sort of the left and the right, the left Twix and the right Twix, we called it, or whether it should be stacked, um, eventually people understood that no matter what, uh, some students would be affected uh, with longer travel times between uh, uh, Class, classes, uh, for instance, if you had a lot of classes on the sixth floor for whatever reason, then that, that would be a, uh, more difficult than uh, if you had classes on lower levels. Um, with regards to congestion, um, I think everybody understood that in the end, it's the same number of students, and we weren't adding or reducing the amount of stairs or circulation, uh, primary circulation routes. So um, that any way we divvied up the space, it was still the same number of students traveling to the same kinds of distances. Uh, so in, in the end, it was all about uh, how, how, do we, how do we feel we can share the building best and um, some of the other finer points will work itself out. Because just to be clear, there were dedicated vertical um, paths 
in each of the sides so that the 500 for each school would still have access to their own circulation, even in the central spine. Okay, thank you, Camila. Yep, thank you, Bill. So we started to uh, involve our co-creators in the more of a design-oriented activities, and one of them is a game called the Space Kit Game, uh, which I'll show you in a moment, and that was really about planning the academic areas with a little bit more um, detail, and then a design charrette where it was really about hands-on design solutions. Um, we've developed a game to facilitate discussions about space planning, the Space Kit Game. Uh, and spark conversations about what kinds of spaces are needed for academic areas. Not, not designing a whole school, because that can be a daunting task, but for academic areas um, and the spaces that knit those academic areas. So in addition to the spatial adjacencies uh, in those areas, the game also tries to tease out ideas about what the learning environment should feel like, not look like, but how it would support learning. Um, so we split up the students, and this was just a student activity. The adults in the campus planning team were not involved. Um, and we split them up into three different teams. And um, they played with these pieces of the, the, that come with the Space Kit game, which include collab, cl classrooms, uh, collaborative areas, support spaces, along with other pieces. Um, you'll see on the bottom right these resource chips in blue triangles, um, all to help foster this discussion about what makes a great learning environment, uh, and more importantly, what the end users want and value. Um, you, you gamers uh, might recognize these hexagonal pieces as being very similar to the Settlers of Catan board game, which is indeed the inspiration of um, how can you get adjacencies without falling into wanting to make a floor plan, which is, after all, uh, my job. So um, we, uh, we, we drew heavily from Settlers of Catan. Um, also, for you binge watchers of Parks and Rec, uh, you might recognize that this looks a lot like the Cones of Dunshire game. It's a lot of fun. Um, but the rules of play, however, start uh, by asking each team to select a handful of vision words, similar to refrigerator magnet poem words, and help establish an idea about what their learning environment would be like. And you can imagine just by trying to read the words on, on the board, on the screen here, that if you had um, a group of, grouping of words that said that the learning environment would, uh, would be secure, and there'll be uh, places to collaborate and hands-on and places for community and joy. It starts to give uh, an ethos to what you're designing to. Um, the game also carves out time to discuss the space type cards, the space types that Bill mentioned, um, allowing everyone uh, space and time to ask questions and to share their preferences. Of course, there's no winners or losers, just an opportunity to test the ideas about which spaces support each other. There should be, there be classrooms next to maker spaces or breakout areas near outdoor learning. Um, eventually, groups land on adjacencies which feel right for them and support the vision that they've created. And here on the screen, you can see the, the vision words on the edge of the board. And that's what the students were working towards. And the resource triangles represent extra details about spaces like technology, certain kinds of furniture, snacks, uh, things that help take the conversation a little bit deeper uh, into what makes a space functional, useful, and engaging. Camila, while you're on that page, can you go back? I think it's worth pointing out that the, the game pieces are intentionally abstract. Uh, and the idea is to keep it at that abstract level so that the, the players don't default to familiar notions of space types like a rectangular classroom. Uh, it's really more about adjacencies and the types of activities that happen in those places as opposed to, as Camila said earlier, what it looks like. Pam mentioned that she uses uh, Lego, and that, that's a great tool as well. Um, we think it's, it, it's really important and helpful to take the planning for games, even though it's fun, and charrettes 
very seriously and thoughtfully consider the ways that you can provide your co-creators with the tools and understanding so their input is relevant, valuable, and insightful. Uh, you know, we're asking people to come and talk about design. And for the designers in the room and the planners in the room, we've got a lot of training. Of course, uh, the layperson doesn't. So as much as we can provide tools, we can, we can help um, accelerate that conversation. In this image, Jeremy, the young student on the left, um, is one of the students for whom the co-creation process was especially empowering. He went from being very reserved and sort of embarrassed about sharing his thoughts to discovering uh, profound confidence about what he had to contribute. Um, and he really blossomed throughout this process. Another activity uh, is, was a more traditional design charrette where we asked Camilo. Sorry to interrupt. Yes. Can we show that video of the uh, kids doing the space kit game? Is now a good time to do that? Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I think we'll ask Aubrey to cue that up. And while she's doing so, uh, let me provide a little bit of background. This video was created not for a forum like ours today, but it was, it was created simply to echo back to the students uh, that we were listening and so they could see themselves in action co-creating and collaborating. And I think uh, they really enjoyed seeing themselves. But what you'll notice in this video, and I may skip through it because it's a little bit long, but you'll notice students speaking very profoundly about learning spaces um, and the kinds of decisions they were making about what they needed um, as they were playing the Space Kit game. Doesn't seem to be running at Robert. Oh, here, maybe? Is it queuing up, Aubrey? And we have chill space where you can sit down. If you've got your own phone, you can sit down. Engage it because everyone will rather do something that they enjoy. Everyone will rather do something that they don't like. And we also like uh, school can be stressful, so having something like that is yeah. good for us. Yeah. So like our idea audio was that since we do have our social space, space, we want, our, we want the kids to good. feel comfortable and it would be easy for them to have. Um, it's coming through the computer speakers loud and clear. I think we're just getting a little bit of an echo right now. If you guys can both mute your phone. We're good if you're going to build stuff. Like an art class, like a moving art class. Uh, a bunch of paintbrushes, uh, things you need for art class. A gear box would be situated right near open lab. So if they have like screwdrivers, saws, whatever. That's easily accessible. Alright, lockers, book bags, extra notebooks and folders, or pencils if you need them. And food over here, like if one of your classes was over here, you wanna wanna walk all the way over there and get snacks or something. So that's like a benefit. So basically when you walk in to the school, you'd have commons, which would have like sofas and chairs and whatever, and probably lunch, like a lunch cafe. Uh in the center of our uh, structure, we put the toolbox where the teachers would be. Uh, sorry, but um, I got overexcited. But, so you know how we're trying to combine the closed lab and open lab? If we put these in the middle, it can start off as a closed lab and can become an open lab. We do that. At the bottom of it, it's a common, and then around it are other social spaces. So if the students were to need a teacher, they could easily access it. They are easily accessible and food safe. Flexible, because it's better to be prepared for multiple things than focus on one. So teachers can practice presentations or study work that is coming up. They do have that space that is provided to them. Uh, we have two rooms, the open space areas, and we use the divider to separate the spaces. So you can have your own conversation with people, you know, now we're going to grow Oh, you said garden. Yeah, but they grow our own vegetables, but like colony areas. Around greenery and the garden, which would be able to like um, have tables, like grow food and stuff. And the community, because if you want to go to school with people, uh, most of the time, most of your day, you're going to spend around people, so it's better to get to know them as a community rather than a stranger. Thank you for queuing that up, Aubrey. 
Um, Camille, you keep going. Yes. So after the space kit, we did a more traditional uh, design charrette, dividing team, the students into five teams and giving them floor plans of specific areas like commons, cafeteria, library, and asking them to uh, really start to consider what those spaces might be like. Um, <clears throat> like the space kit, obviously very highly facilitated exercise with very clear directions and a lot of materials. Um, but also a real desire to keep the vibe relaxed and creative. And in the middle of the screen, you can see a, a pair of uh, jogging shoes propped up against the table, a very chill, relaxed atmosphere with snacks. Um, also, uh, a lot of friendly guidance. On the upper left, you see Anjum, one of our architects in Philadelphia office, providing very friendly, re reliable, um, approachable guidance. And the students were encouraged to collage, sketch, and to make the floor plans their own in, in any way that uh, they could. And this was a really powerful exercise, more so than I think than other uh, shredding ones we've done, Bill, I think because a lot of the groundwork that we had laid beforehand uh, in conversations about their existing schools, doing the space kit game, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. The five groups presented their design to the, their designs to the peers, and um, again, like Jeremy uh, in the previous slide that I had mentioned, uh, they saw that their ideas were enthusiastically received and uh, uh, by by classmates and, and adults alike, and, and uh, they really came up with some very powerful ideas. Um, but I can't say enough about the about uh, the value of creating uh, an atmosphere where all thoughts are um, important, equally important. You know, a safe space, you can see smiling faces here, a real sense of accomplishment. A place where all voices are heard and there aren't any wrong answers. It's really the key to engaging students, and frankly, anybody for that matter, as, as co-designers. Let me show you some of the results from the Space Kit game and the results from the design charrette. So from the Space Kit game, remember we had three groups, and uh, these are the results of their gaming. Um, what you'll notice is that there are emergent themes, uh, and you'll see them in the poetry words. Um, and also in some of the diagramming, which I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up for you in, in a moment. But words like collaboration, representation, um, community, in their game boards and in their vision for their school. The idea about role modeling and uh, representation of student work became very strong and powerful as well. But when we look at the, the diagrams for all of the three game pieces, we also see emerging themes about, in some meaningful way, trying to connect to the outdoor space, which isn't surprising for an urban school, but also um, ideas about how to use the spaces in between classrooms the common, as common areas and places for a lot of collaboration, especially in a building, if you recall the photographs, which Bill shared that um, doesn't have any collaboration areas. <clears throat> so strong ideas um, that were further uh, reflected in some of the language and uh, ideas from the design charrette. Um, so the charrette really helped the team, or design team, uh, and the students and committee members start to coalesce around a look and feel for the school. Uh, there were powerful design observations like the value of daylight, um, and how breaking down larger spaces into smaller zones can be helpful, especially in spaces that are, are a little bit overwhelming. Um, also clear direction about incorporating murals, which uh, for those who don't know, the, uh, Philadelphia is a city of many, many murals, um, but also artwork and other student work display areas. Again, these are ideas coming directly from students um, and, uh, and essentially project requirements. Um, also, a great emphasis on variety of, of different kinds of spaces. 
in the collaboration uh, through collaborative zones. Also, emerging preferences about what kinds of materials are engaging uh, or warm. Uh, wood, natural wood touches, you'll see in, in, some, in the conceptual design. Um, also observations about how spaces promote mental health. Uh, on the bottom left, you'll see this note that the student, one of the students put in that says, a bright room makes people feel better. I mean, this, this starts to look like a, like a, a construction drawing to me with the bottom left with being like general notes. Uh, and for you, uh, design professionals uh, on the meeting, imagine putting general notes like that on your construction documents. Uh, a good reminder of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, also, some specificity about furniture and variety on the bottom left. Uh, this this, this uh, drawing comes complete with a furniture legend. Uh, you know, this is what design is all about, and the students really were able to um, pull together some exceptional design ideas. So the design results both from both the space kit game and the charrette were incorporated into the conceptual design, and it's now under construction, so I don't have final photos, but I'll show you a few of the, the early conceptual design images uh, where you'll see a, a great deal of student ideas embedded into the, the design, ideas like connecting the interior to the exterior, in this instance, a roof terrace beyond. A desire to transform as much of the school into an inspiring place. Uh, here you can see the Ben Franklin living room with the before corridor picture on the bottom left and the soon to be after living room rendering uh, with a variety of furniture and material warmth, really transformative. We imagine uh, the school uh, as it is now, the double loaded corridor having these pockets of social spaces. Um, living room or the variety of spaces uh, help to promote the variety of spaces for collaboration and socialization in the school. The strategies about breaking down the scale of otherwise overwhelming and bland spaces like the, the dining space and employing a variety of furniture types to provide comfort and choice. In short, how do we honor the student experience? You can see the, the, the original entry experience on the bottom left, which is welcoming students into the building by two metal detectors. Um, and how can that be transformed into a, a, a rival sequence that is welcoming and affirming? But not every room in the school gets a major overhaul. In some places, we were just doing paint and finishes. And so our interior design team conceptualized an idea about stringing pearls, not literally, uh, throughout the building to dress up an otherwise unremarkable uh, uh, building, not unlike the way Jackie O here has got pearls to uh, dress up a rather casual outfit. <clears throat> But those pearls were conceived of as more ways to honor the student voice. <clears throat> this idea of representation, how could there be display areas, tack boards that are more than just tack boards, <clears throat> but some, something that truly celebrates and highlights the work, honors it. Um, how can we, where, for instance, pulling out a door, uh, put back niches and other places for variety in the school, and any additional places to provide collaboration uh, for students and small groups is something that they're, we're profoundly proud of doing through the co-creation process, and they simply just wanted to do more of it in small group uh, format. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes here. Um, I'm going to wrap up with some of the outcomes and recommendations, but I would encourage all of you to um, share observations or ask questions in the Q&A chat box there. Uh, I see Adam Byfeld on from Henrico County Public Schools just outside of Richmond, Virginia. Adam, glad you could join us. Share your questions, comments. So um, I said this earlier that this kind of co-creation is part and parcel of next generation learning. It's about collaboration, creation, communication, critical thinking, and citizenship. And we saw all of that modeled here in this co-location exercise. Um, as I said, the, 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 the co-creation really became a, a crucible for 
this project. And um, whereas at the beginning, the, the adults in the room in particular, almost exclusively, had real concerns about this, the students over the period of this, this co-creation demonstrated the potential of the co-location. Um, and in the end, the adults were less concerned after they saw how well the students worked together. Um, it made students active participants in their future. And by the way, we got some great design ideas out of them. Um, so here are some recommendations going away. The, the first recommendation ought to be very clear. It's to do engage students, do engage students, find a way. And, you know, these were high school students. Um, but, you know, the question is often asked, how do you engage middle school or elementary school students? And for the middle school students, I'd remind this group of A4LEers that um, A4LE supports the school's next program, which is a competition to design the school of the future. And it's middle school students who are doing that. And if you've ever sat in on one of the, the, those juries, or if you've heard the, the winners present at uh, A4LE LearningScapes, you know that they have some incredible ideas. And the same is true of the elementary school students. So do engage students. Uh, and the research, if you're, if you're looking for justification, you can, you can cite this research uh, as a means for, for justifying getting the students involved. Then the other recommendations, trust the process. And, and you do have to let go a bit. Um, it, it does get messy, and that's OK. Um, but be intentional. Have a plan. Go in with a plan. And, and as much as you have to be um, trust the process and sort of give and take, it is important to be intentional, have a plan. Encourage broad participation. Let go of control. Be flexible. Be convenient. And if you want to get students fully engaged, um, provide food. Um, it's great to have that food there for them and uh, to keep them energized and going. And by the way, I like food too, so I'm sure you do as well. Um, yeah, so I'll go back to the student shadowing thing um, and just just say, I can't say how much, uh, how important I think this is to do this student shadowing. Um, you really do gain a new perspective. Um, and I won't, I won't say pack your own lunch, but I will say that eating a school lunch uh, as an adult is a whole different experience, uh, as you can see here. So um, we got a question here from Wayne Lee in Frederick County, Virginia. So the students were involved in the design process at several points along the way. Any thoughts about involving them after construction? Wayne, that's a, that's a great question. And I know that even beyond some of the, the CTE classes that we sometimes get involved with, with, um, with doing site visits and stuff, um, the challenge becomes uh, safety. Um, whether or not you can get the students involved on the site or not. But one of the things that we've done is, and I think you guys did this in Frederick County, is you made the building part of the curriculum. And you had a, a group of students who made a, um, um, a lesson plan designed around the site where they engaged the site and, and created the, uh, the QR codes for a site walk. And folks walking the site could and identify different aspects of the building and the landscape both intentionally designed and those that were part of happenstance. And so I think any time that you can get the students involved in engaging the building of the site to, to develop the curriculum or reinforce the curriculum, that's one way. Um, Camila, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. There, um, so there's two aspects. There's the, the, the learning aspect of, of the construction process, but there's also, especially for renovation projects and additions, uh, construction can be disruptive, of course, uh, especially if it's phased construction. Um, so involving the students and the staff as a way to get them excited about the disruption uh, is really important. So I'm reminded of something that um, Henrico County did here in Virginia. Um, the principal made t-shirts for the staff and, uh, and for the students, and I think I think the contractor actually helped contribute to buy all the T-shirts, and I can't remember what the what the T-shirt said, uh, but it certainly made it we're 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 all in this together kind of uh, uh, of experience. Um, and this the, this was an elementary school, and they were just very thrilled about what was coming because of the excitement created 
um, through the school and the contractor, in, in fact, about, uh, about their new renovations. Thanks, Camila. If there are any other questions, now would be the time to ask them. Uh, short of that, I would just like to thank everybody for joining. Again, it just, it's so important that we all, as A4LE members, stay connected and continue to, to have a dialogue. Um, oh, here's a question. Is the renovation complete at this point? Camila, you want to pick up there since Nicole's not on right now? All right, uh, sure. The, the renovation is a phased and, and occupied, uh, so it, it's not complete yet. Um, the initial phases focused on some of the common areas, dining spaces, um, but we're, we're all waiting for, uh, for the final hammer to be swung and paint to dry. Um, so that we can get in and get final photographs. Okay, and I'll just remind everyone that you can submit your questions in writing by typing them into the Q&A pod. So we'll pause for a moment to see if there are any others. Okay, well, it looks like there are no further questions. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? Not for me. Thank you guys for attending. And thank you for your questions. Thank you all. Okay. So that will conclude our session. I'd like to thank our speakers for their participation and thank all of our registrants for attending today's program. Your certificate of attendance and evaluation form will be emailed to you within 24 hours, and we ask that you take a few moments to provide us with your thoughts on today's program. You can register for all of our upcoming live webinars as well as on-demand recordings of previous programs at https://education.a4le.org. Thanks again, and have a wonderful day. Oh, John Hill clapped. <laughs>